for another uh, dose of talent talks and we've got a great guest this time we got annie foley she's the director of hr for fentress architects really excited as any uh, any kind of brings a business leadership and an hr leadership background to the table um, so she's seen uh, both perspectives when it comes to the hiring process so annie we're excited to have you thanks um, i'm glad to be here thanks great well let's dive into it so annie let's talk about our, our main focus right now on this one is, all right, you're about to go hire a key position within your business. What does that look like in your background? What are the factors, the things that you need to get stakeholders aligned on to make sure you have the right hiring process and elements together? So the main thing for me is to understand what is the pain point we're trying to fix. If it's, if it's one position, of, if it's multiple positions, it doesn't really matter. What I'm trying to focus on is what, what hole or what void are we trying to cover? So what set of skills or prior experience, um, try to define that as much as possible and be able to say, this is, this is our pain point really. Okay, great, no, that's absolutely. It, in your experience, who are kind of the stakeholders that you normally bring in on a hiring initiative? So if we're, if we're filling a position in the studio, which we define as our um, architects or our interior designers or the interior side, then I will definitely bring in the project manager for, because our studio is different from some other architectural studios in that we don't do it by project type. Um, we do it by project itself. So uh, our studios is open, everybody's in there and we're not based off of skills um, in the studio. So um, I always look to the project manager to really tell me who, what kind of person, what kind of um, even personality or, you know, is this somebody that we, they're looking for someone who's better at talking to clients, being client facing, or is this somebody who's in the background who's, um, doing the daily grind and getting things through because there can be personality differences, but I want them to tell me what their pain point is and what skills are missing. And then I'll, so after the project manager, I'll always talk to the principal in charge of the project because they have a higher level view of um, possibly that role and some other stuff we might be looking for that might be missing from the firm wide level. Um, that's, that's oftentimes very helpful too. I apologize for the printer in the background. No, absolutely. So, so let's talk about, um, all right, so you're bringing these stakeholders in. Your end game is to get a really good hire. Sometimes it goes wrong, right? What would be some pitfalls of what happens where you're like, this process didn't play out the way we wanted it to? Uh, your desperation hire. When, the, when there's a conflict in the time frame of how soon you need to get someone on board. I believe that that is something that is often overlooked or underestimated. Um, when you have a position that is urgent to fill, at least for us, I can speak, you know, for us, um, where I have seen that process uh, deteriorate a bit is when there's this idea, somebody on leadership has the idea that this position needs to be filled right away and they're not necessarily taking the time to really look at all the candidates. They um, see someone who's good enough and maybe they just move forward because, well, we need to get it done. That can come back to really haunt you. That's, that's interesting. We surveyed over a thousand HR leaders in 2018 around what was most important to them in the hiring process, speed, cost, or quality. 95% said quality. So to your <laughs> point, let's get the right person the first time but they said by far and away speed was the greatest pressure that actually plays out in the real world. And you know, prior to my time as an HR professional, um, I could see that as somebody who I was a hiring manager, I was an employee. Um, there is this, you know, relatively important need to fill a position as soon as possible but when you take an aggregate look at it from the aspect of costs involved and um, you know just fill, being quick to fill that position 
doesn't do you any good if it's a bad hire. It's always going to cost you so much more to have to let someone go. And there's always, then, then you have those wounds that kind of come from having made the bad hire. It's your fault. Um, you have to go back and do your hits or misses and, you know, why, how did we get here? How do we do this? How, you know, try to approach it from the humane side of how do we let this person go who we chose, but we chose poorly. And so there's a lot of um, just extra work, psychological and actual work that goes into then opening that job search back up and trying to then go, go about it again. It's, um, so yeah, time, it is important. I understand that. And you want to keep, make sure that people are not being lost to a delayed process, but also that they are really, um, you know, that you're not just doing it to be fast. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. A couple of the factors that I, that I hear that are frustrations across from, from even the recruiting team, HR team compared to a hiring manager is, all right, this is what I want in a role, but I, I need to align compensation mm -hmm. to what I want in that role. And I also need to align attractability of that position, meaning do I, I want someone with 15 years of experience, and that's what I really want, but basically I'd be asking someone to take a lateral move to come over and do the exact same job they're doing today with our organization compared to the one they're at. And I can't really can't pay them anything more either. So there's, there's a misalignment of a recruitment with uh, tractability and compensation. Do you run into that? And if so, what are some things that you've done to navigate some of that calibration? Of course we run into that. So, um, when you're talking about someone, especially in architecture that has 15, let's use your example of 15 years of experience, um, that has for the last few years been the, the toughest position to fill um, for many factors, mostly because there's not, there aren't a lot of architects that fall in that 15 to 20 year, well, I'd say 10 to maybe 10 to 20 year range of experience because of the last recession. So the crisis that happened forced a, a lot of architects out of the field. And so they don't have those requisite years of experience around 15. So if you're looking for 15, amongst the um, older generation of architects, they just feel like, oh, there's these, you know, 15 years, that's the magic number for them. And um, the fact is, is it's a smaller pool. There just aren't so many of them. So then um, how we've dealt with that or how I've dealt with that is I look at, um, you know, I try to find as close as possible. You find the unicorn person who shows up every now and again, but um, you know, you open that range up around 10 to 15, eight to 15, because there you do find more people who then are, have the skills, they've got the abilities, the capabilities, they just don't have that number. And um, quite honestly, I rely then on my background in sales to then sell that person to, to the leadership team or the project manager, or whoever it is that is stuck on that number to show um, why that's not necessarily the critical point that they're trying to focus on. That really what they've told me, and I'll go back to my notes and say, hey, this is what we talked about. This is the type of work we need to get done. That can be done by somebody with X amount of experience. It doesn't have to be 15. And, you know, quite honestly, sometimes it goes the other way too, where um, they actually do need someone with 20 or more years of experience and they've just focused on this 15 amount. So um, then we get into the compensation issues more with that. But uh, when it comes to the experience that you're looking for, you do have to be a little bit flexible with, um, with you're talking about numbers of years. And then also on the comp side, you can be creative with how to attract someone who does have that experience, but maybe your base salary can't, can't be more than what they're currently making. No, that's great. I, I, that's the exact same insight I share with organizations is we believe have a little wider funnel in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Look at some people that it could be a little bit of a job opportunity from a job stretch. Also look at people with lateral move capabilities but interview more people to really figure out who would be the optimal fit long-term instead of being narrow to start it, yeah. which creates yeah. a lot of frustration for both parties. When you're talking 
a major talent scarcity, which you see in the AC space. Yeah, and also people with that, um, you know, if you're looking at that range from like 10 to between 10 and 20 years, they are also looking for things in addition to salary. So they are looking for growth opportunities. And if you have that for them, that is um, almost priceless sometimes. I'm going to get off topic slightly here, but Annie, have you noticed any changes or conversations around org chart adjustments in the new in the new world compared to the old world of how you can hire somebody and then give them more promotional opportunities to fit with the new generations or escalate people to people to fill the gap of that major scarcity from 10 to 20 years? So with our firm, um, we, we have a pretty flat org chart. We don't have a whole lot of different hierarchy levels. So we haven't really dealt with that, but what we do see and what I do love is that we, we have more people stepping into those mentoring roles. And so um, our promotion, our path to promotion is uh, more based off of what you've done on projects and the work you've done. And there's a, a first level of entry with like five years of service, but from there, anybody can be considered. And so once you're in that associates group and senior associates group, um, it's a little more egalitarian as far as who can be in that promotional area and then take on more responsibility before you get to that principal's level. And you can exercise all of those benefits of being in that group without having to be judged on a title, if you will. No, I think that's great. I think that's, you know, especially when you look at what generational differences want, right? Ge millennials want something different than baby boomers and that significance, that purpose. How can, even if you keep a flat org chart, how can you create those opportunities for the for high performers to accomplish more and gain more and be more significant um, so they feel the desire to stay and grow with you mm -hmm. compared to growing with somebody else? Yeah. Um, very much and that is something that in addition to that, the smaller pool of talent for that 15 year, as we were talking about that 15 year level is top of mind for us is also how to retain staff because um, it, as with most industries, it's no different for ours. A lot of times the easiest way to move up is to move out. Uh, and that's something that people do look, they, they do, that's, there's a lot of natural attrition to that, um, also based off of the millennial uh, experience in the workforce, it, it is moving more towards that. So we've, I've been trying to help educate our leadership team on the fact that people will move out. Um, and it's not a bad thing because we also have boomerang employees. So we want to be attractive so that when they go and see if the grass is greener or not, based off of culture, based off of pay, based off of project type, a lot of times they do come back and try to see if there's any way to fit back in. And we've allowed that. And um, we do have a bit of a culture of boomerang employees, which I believe brings a lot of good back to the company. I like that. I, I, you see, you celebrate when they join your organization and sometimes you celebrate when they leave, but in a positive, we appreciate yeah. that you spent a season of life with us. Mm -hmm. And if you want to come back, we're going to keep that option open as some people do value variety right and so they need to see what other organizations or projects look like and might realize that what you have long term is the best long term fit later so um, Annie some great insight this was really good I know we focused on a few uh, key topics early on but I, I like some of the additional uh, information as well so we appreciate your time thanks a lot thank you it's my pleasure